Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world with self-care strategies from Chinese medicine. I'm your host, Brody Welch, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Welcome to today's show. I'm your host, Brody Welch, and with me today is a very special guest. This is Megan Chambers, and she's actually been behind the scenes of A Healthy Curiosity since its inception. Megan is my office manager, and she has been instrumental in helping me produce the show notes to edit the podcast, and as well as assisting me in the day-to-day operations in my clinic and all the things that I need to do in order to manage my my online business, as well as keeping my sanity on a day-to-day basis. And Megan, in the year and a half or so that we've been working together, I have come to know her as a woman of great insight and very strong opinions about how the world should be and what's wrong with it. And really, the, the two of us in, in breaks from patients often find ourselves in, in heated conversations about the intersection between people's health and the political system and the intersection of the personal and the sociocultural issues. And one of the things we found ourselves talking about one day was the way that women not only bend their boundaries around time and drop their own priorities in service of literally everyone else in their lives and how we're socialized to do this, but even when it comes to what going, what's going on, what we're willing to take on in our own brains and in our own memories. So before we jump, jump into that topic, I just want to mention that I so appreciate Megan and all of her hard work. She is a woman of vast skills and clarity and presence. And unfortunately, she has given me her notice and she's going to be moving to Portland and she's in search of a job. So if you're out there and you're listening to this show and you know of an opportunity for a a person who will be an incredible asset to any organization regarding that deals with communication um, or marketing or helping the world, um, that, that Megan is your woman and you can email us at the show and we'll put you in touch. Anyway, Megan, this is your first time in the world of podcasting and welcome to today's show. Thanks so much for being willing to come on and share our private conversation with the public. Thanks, Brody. Thanks for having me. That was a really nice introduction. So l- recap your rant a little bit, like the, the, the one day that we, we started this chat. Sure, yeah. So uh, something that I've, that I've noticed, that I've experienced, that I've lived, I mean, both on the receiving end and the giving end, you know, I'm perfectly willing to say, is expecting other people to, to think for me and sort of do, do the job of remembering things that I think that I'm not going to remember or do tasks that I know that I'll forget to do instead of, well, in, instead of, you know, using tools that are at my disposal to do those things, to my, things myself, to remind myself of things, to, um, to make sure that I show up on time for my commitments, um, et cetera. So it's something, yeah, I, like I use I, my own example, it's some, but it's also something that I've seen in the wider culture, not only uh, in the workplace, but parents and their kids and even, you know, friends with other friends who will, de- you know, depend on them to do things for them. So it's, uh, yeah, this idea of reclaiming, reclaiming your brain for the things that you as a person really should be responsible for and not taking on other people's responsibilities and not letting them push those boundaries, not letting them make responsibilities for you. Absolutely. I think both sides of that equation are worth exploring in this conversation. <laughs> so, so let's start with that idea of, of outsourcing your own brain to someone else. Like, hey, could you remind me to, <laughs> to go yeah. do this thing that I intend to do? What helped you realize that? It, well, first of all, why should we stop doing that? Why did you find it was important to stop doing that? What did it do for you? And how did you manage to shift from being someone who did outsource stuff like that to others to really taking ownership and responsibility yourself? Um, well, the, the two people that I noticed myself doing it with most often were my boyfriend, my now husband, uh, then he was my boyfriend, um, and my mother. And, you know, it was just, it was, it's just little things, which is why you don't think a lot of it when you're doing it. 
little stuff like, you know, can you remind me to get this at the grocery store? Or don't let me forget to call this person about this kind of a thing. When really the, you know, the thing that makes the most sense is not to put that responsibility on someone else. It's to put a reminder in my iPhone or to make a note of it somewhere that I will, you know, definitely see or, you know, and so it's not just that, that's what it did. Reclaiming that for myself gave me more agency in my own life and allows me to actually be sure that the things that I need to get done will get done instead of hoping they'll get done because hopefully that other person will remember to remind me. <laughs> like that's, that's putting a lot of, a lot of, re- that's spreading things out way more than they need to be spread out in terms of responsibility. Right. So if you're, if you're relying on your mother or your husband to remind you to, to do anything, right, small or large, that essentially if they don't live up to their end of the bargain, which really they shouldn't have to because it's not necessarily their priority, right. that, 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 actually, that actually takes you away from making your biggest impact. Right. And it, and it prevents me, well, it, it gives me an excuse if things don't go right, you know, like uh-huh. it, it lets me be like, oh, well, my, you know, my husband didn't remind me. So great. Thanks a lot, husband. <laughs> Poor husband. Um, <laughs> instead of me being like, "Wow, I really should have like, I really should have done more to make sure that I followed through on that commitment," because I was the one that made the commitment in the first place. So it sounds like it's it's really just owning that responsibility that is is a way of of actually increasing your personal power instead of feeling like I'm I, you know I'm helpless without these reminders. Right. Yeah. So on the other end of the spectrum, I know uh, that we've talked also about about you taking on other people's requests of remind me to do this or or putting things on you that you don't you haven't necessarily agreed to. So tell me a little bit about that and how it, and how you're working to change the patterns there. Sure. Yeah. So <laughs> this is actually back from when I was in college, um, and I had. My, I, I was friends with a lot of guys in college that were not taught how to like really take care of themselves before going away to college, especially in terms of sort of, I, I guess, what would traditionally be considered, you know, like within the realm of female gender roles or something. So like cleaning, basic cleaning skills. Or laundry, and, right? Isn't that? Right, exactly. <laughs> it, yes. It, like most specifically, really. I had friends who came to college and, you know, like their first load of laundry and bam, pink socks for the rest of the year, you know? And one of my friends, he didn't know how to iron. Um, So when it came time to go in and do an interview and he needed a press shirt, he wasn't aware of how to do that, which is, you know, which is fine. I mean, I, I think that it's good to strive to know how to do those things when they're things that you need to incorporate into your daily life, but everybody has to learn things sometime. And he would ask me uh, to iron his shirts for him because I what like I didn't know how to iron, um, which is apparently a rarer skill than I thought it was. So <laughs> this happened several, you know, several times over the course of the year, and I didn't mind doing it because he was a great guy, a good friend, and but it was interesting that he never over, you know, this is like over the course of four years that we were in college, he didn't ever bother to learn how to do it himself. Right. Well, why would he if you're just willing to do it for him? Right. Which is like, so there, So yeah, there's totally a two-way street there, which is that I didn't ever set a boundary. I didn't ever say like, hey, do you want to learn how to do this so that I don't have to do it for you next time? Like, I, you know, I didn't force the issue, but at the same time, he never bothered to take responsibility for it either. It was like you said, it was a lot easier for him to let me iron his shirts every time and do something else instead. (laughs) Um, You know, ironing isn't everybody's favorite task. I get that. But when you need press shirts, you need press shirts. It's a good skill to have. Absolutely. So, and this is something that we see all the time in clinic when people are, people are running themselves into the ground. And especially I see this in families where a lot of the conversations we end up happening are about how to strategize for women, especially to have more time in their day. And I I dig a little deeper about what they're doing in their families and the amount that they're doing for their kids is astounding to me. Now Mm -hmm. I, um, you know, I'm certainly not going to tell people how to parent, but the idea of being able to, the, the idea that you're actually helping everyone 
everybody when you're, for example, teaching your kid how to iron or you're teaching mm-hmm. your kid how to do a basic household task that they're eventually going to need as a core competency for being a, a, an adult <laughs> in the world. And that actually it, everyone can benefit, that you're not punishing your kid by encouraging them to make their own lunch for school, for example. It's like, that's actually a skill that, they, that they're going to need to have. And teaching them even the time management that's involved with that, if it means that you as as an overworked, stressed person who's potentially fighting a chronic illness gets a half hour more of sleep in a day, it is absolutely a worthy trade-off and it's actually a win-win. Absolutely. I mean, the, like we're talking about training, you know, training humans to be good housemates. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, like learning how, like not, you know, and, and that is that is a life skill that they will need pretty much at least from the age of 18 onwards, though certainly before that, because they're already housemates. They live in your house. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, you have to deal with their messes. And if they don't clean them up, that means that it's on your plate instead, along with all of the other things that are already there. So, and that goes being a good housemate, being a good partner, eventually, if they ever, if they ever fall in love and, and want to spend their life with someone, then it's good to know how to do the dishes and iron shirts because you, it's not fair to always expect your partner to do it for you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's funny that you bring up the housemate thing because Jeremy and I, when we first, when we first met and I first became an Insta parent to his children um, who are, who are now my full-time stepkids, uh, mm-hmm. the, the notion of that there's a difference between somebody who literally doesn't know how to do anything and a crappy roommate who's like fully grown. <laughs> <laughs> and that with kids, yeah. they're on the continuum somewhere in between. But yes, training training people to be to be better to be better housemates, to be better roommates. Um, everyone wins. You are helping society. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm curious, why do you think why do you think we don't question when somebody says, "Hey, Megan, would you remind me to to uh, call, not as your not as your employer, but you know, if I were to say that, <laughs> and I'm your friend, or I'm your partner, or I'm you know, or I'm your mom, or whoever." Um, And I'm asking you to help me remember something. Why do you think we just take it on unquestioningly? That's a good question. I would, and I can't speak for everybody, but I would say because we love those people, you know, like they're people that we care about. We want to make them happy. The idea of making their lives better is appealing to us, you know, and that's also part of fostering good community. I'm not talking about, I mean, and I'm not, this isn't what you're saying, but I'm not talking about, you know, never doing anybody a favor. I'm not talking about like never doing anything for anyone. I'm just saying that if you are able to catch yourself asking other people to do something that you could easily do for yourself, evaluate why you're making that request. Yeah, I think actually that that is super key, that the that having boundaries with the ones we love is one of the hardest things there is, right? Like being able yes. to, that we want to be helpful, but we also don't want to enable someone else to be stuck. We don't mm-hmm. want to, we don't want to enable somebody to never learn how to do their own laundry. We never want, you know, like we never want to, you know, when we reinforce, if I'm continually taking on the the responsibility of remembering something that my husband could just as easily remember on his own, I'm not helping him reinforce those neural pathways that he needs to remember the important things. And so it's actually it, that I that I actually have to see it as service to say, actually, no, that's not my job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, like, and that can be really hard in the moment is to figure out, you know, that there's a huge difference between doing someone a favor and enabling their stuckness and just being yes. able to run it, to evaluate that in the moment that thinking, do I want to take this on? And should I take this on? Right. Should mm-hmm. I take this on? Like really is everyone served by me doing this? Absolutely. And I think that that like, uh, you know, going back to parenting a little bit, like it, it's hard sometimes, I think, for people to to find the boundary there, because on the one hand, you know, you have these young humans who aren't experienced in a lot of ways. So they do need guidance, like they do, they need advice, they need, they need your sage wisdom. But at the same time, swooping in to solve tiny social problems between them and their friends prevents them from learning how to socialize and what's appropriate and you know, how to problem solve within relationships and swooping in to fix every pro- every mistake they make on their homework doesn't help them learn. It doesn't help them figure out what they don't know. So 
goes back to it's okay to fail. It's okay to let, it's okay to, for you to fail. It's okay for you to let your kids fail. That's part of learning and growing. No, it's not. We're all, <laughs> we're all supposed to be perfect all the time. Don't you listen yeah, to the uh. show? <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, and I think, you know, and that also speaks to like people learning about con- the consequences of their actions. What does the next version of you look like? The upgraded version of me gets great sleep, experiences abundant energy and flow, loves her body, and gets a ridiculous amount done from a place of centered presence. The thing is, the same habits that got you where you are aren't necessarily going to get you where you want to be, and it's tough to change habits on your own. It's so much easier to have some guidance, accountability, and supportive peers who will help you raise your bar. I want to help you off your plateau, to help you bridge the gap between knowing what you need to do to take care of yourself and actually doing those things, like dialing in a daily body-mind practice, getting enough restorative sleep, eating what your body can best digest, and moving through life at a pace that feels easeful and in integrity with your own energy. If you feel ready to step into the next version of yourself and really prioritize the essential habits of self-care necessary to step into your most thriving self, I hope you'll join me for 11 weeks to level up your life. The next round of Level Up Your Life starts in September 2017. Just after the kids are back to school, you're done with your summer travel, and you're ready to really upgrade your life to do the fall differently, to go into the holidays stress-free. If that might be good timing for you, I'd love to hop on the phone and see if it's a good fit. Go to BrodyWelch.com, head to the Level Up page, and click the link to schedule. At the very least, it'll help you get clear as to where to put your energy in order to feel how you want to feel. The freedom to fail, uh, like watching, you know, like that we, we might be willing to take risks, risk for ourselves, but that watching someone else fail is one of the hardest things there is, right? I think that is not an it easy is. thing. Have, have you had a time in your life where you've had to do that? And, and if so, I'd love to, I'd love to know what helped you stay and not rescue. My brother, who I love very much, he's in college right now and he's doing quite well. In high school, he struggled. He struggled with motivation. He struggled. He also has a lot of social anxiety. So it's just, I mean, it's hard for him to be in places with lots of people. And he's, you know, easily distracted by small sensory things. I and my parents and my parents definitely more so than me had to let him make the choices that he was going to make about his academics and then deal with the consequences of those choices. And that was that was hard sometimes because when you see someone doing something that you know is going to cause them more pain in the future, it's hard to not try to like step in and prevent that from happening. His senior year, he had this writing class that he just hated and he didn't want to have to do it in the first place and he did everything he could to get out of it, which didn't end up working because he did the credit either way, um, which is what we all tried to tell him in the beginning. But you know, Um, And he went most of the year just sort of refusing to do the class and ended up having to do most of the work in like the last month, which as I'm sure everyone can imagine was really, really stressful and unpleasant. Um, It's a lot of work to cram into like the last month of your senior year. Absolutely. Was he able to do it? He was able to do it. He pulled it off. But the hard, the hardest thing was like watching him resist it the entire year knowing how smart he is and knowing how capable he is, you know, it wasn't, it certainly wasn't that he couldn't do the class, but he had convinced himself that he couldn't. Mm -hmm. And so we all had eventually to just sort of let go and let him, you know, in this case, he only started to fail because he, he did end up, he did end up passing the class and getting the credit and graduated from high school. But But we had to, we had to let him put it off because nothing that we could say mattered. It didn't like, there was nothing that we could do. He was determined any conversation turned into a tumultuous fight. And like I said, this, you know, this example, he did, he did end up, he did end up resting the class. It ended up okay. But he did cause himself a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress, not only in that last month when he had to do all that work, but also all year when everyone was trying to, and by everyone, I mean his, you know, his, uh, the people that he was working with at school. He caused a lot of uh, stress and anxiety for himself all year because 
he was butting heads with people who were insisting that he needed to do this to graduate while he insisted that it just wasn't going to happen, but he was going to graduate anyway. So, so there, it sounds like there is a certain point at which he realized that he did actually have to do it in order to graduate and pulled it off. Is that right? It is. And he, I mean, he, he reached the point where he finally realized that nobody else was going to do it for him. Mom got wasn't going to go in and talk, talk, you know, talk her, talk him out of it or talk the, well, sorry, talk the administrative administration out of him having to do it. Nobody was going to bail him out. He thought some, he thought there was going to be a loophole somewhere. He was so sure that he was going to find a way to not have to do this. And when he realized that nobody was going to swoop in, nobody was going to prevent this from happening. That's when it happened. Such a good thing that it did, right? I know. I know Absolutely. how hard. I know how hard that was for you at the time, right? For it to to hold back and to to feel like, oh, I want this. I want so much for for him to graduate, and there's nothing I can do about it. You know, ultimately, right? All of the all of your urging and cajoling and trying to get him to do it all year long didn't make the difference until until he realized I like that I actually have no I have no other res- recourse than to rely on myself. Mm-hmm. So that's really um, it in terms of in terms of helping people. The, the, just where I go with that in terms of helping people make changes in their lives that are, um, that are hard mm-hmm. <laughs> is, that, is to get it to, to get them to identify with their deep why, like, why is it, why does it really matter? You know, like that ultimately, mm-hmm. yeah, it's hard to resist sugar. It's hard to make time to go to sleep. It's hard to make time to exercise every day or to meditate or all these things that we know we should be doing, but aren't doing the thing that helps us be able to to do the hard thing now is to align with why it matters. And so for him, having that deeper goal of being able to graduate was was probably the thing that, that kicked in of like really realizing the connection between this small hard thing or this big hard thing and this right. big goal. It, would you say that that's accurate or like was is that I would definitely I would definitely say that's accurate. I think yeah that it was a combination of like I mean he he had the goal, he knew he wanted to graduate. That wasn't an option, but he was so sure he was going to be able to get there a different yeah. way. Yeah, exactly. And then when and when the realization set in that that wasn't it and I and I think that this is a good you know like we all make a lot of excuses about getting enough sleep and not eating sugar and all, all of these health choices that we make. It's easy to say that it's too hard. <gasps> That it's yeah. too, it takes too much effort. Well, it is hard. It, it is definitely, absolutely, and that's like, and that's that's to me why like it. This was hard. This was hard for him to do. It was hard for him to overcome that resistance in his mind. That one told him that he couldn't do it, and two told him that he was going to be able to do. He was going to find a way out of it. There was going to be another another course that he could take, another course of action that he could take. And when he realized, when he resigned himself to the fact that the only way that he could get to his ultimate goal, which was graduation, was by doing this, that's when the acceptance happened. And I think in the same regard, when you realize that the only way that you're going to feel better, the only way that your health is going to improve is if you cut sugar or if you get more sleep or if you exercise more. Once you realize that there's no other way to achieve those, achieve that health goal than doing those things, it becomes a lot easier to do them. Yeah. Well, of, of course it does. Like there's a, and, and, uh, the fact that it's important to have support and accountability from peers as well, that, that it's really tough to get there alone. And I bet that if your brother was living in a household of people that didn't value graduating from high school, that didn't value going on to college and, and, and that the importance of higher education, do you think that he would have, have really like dug in and done the hard thing and met that challenge on his own? Uh, probably not. No. I, and I would say the same thing of myself. And I was like, I, I, I was, a a person who found ac- academics relatively easy. High school was relatively easy for me. Not that I didn't have my struggles, but like, I, I definitely didn't, I didn't have anywhere near the obstacles to overcome that my brother did. But I think that for, for anybody, if you don't, if you don't have people around encouraging you to achieve those goals and, encouraging you to have goals for that matter, you know, to, to shoot for something. Yeah. And it's a lot easier to say, you know, when things get hard to say, I, I give up, I can't, I can't do this. I obviously can't do this. Yeah. Well, and it's, and, yeah. and the, the idea that, that you as a supportive sister and family member, that you held this belief that he could do it, even when he didn't believe that he could do it himself or didn't necessarily want to do it himself. But so it was like your, but your mindset 
the idea that like, A, this is important. B, you can do this. And C, I expect you to do this. Mm-hmm. That, that actually contributed to him ultimately being able to do it. Because without that, uh, without that energetic support and without you kind of holding that space and your presence in his life, uh, that it's likely that he wouldn't have been able to, to dig deep for that, for that willpower to do the hard thing. I think that's true. And I also think like, in retrospect, I wish that I had focused more on that aspect of it. And, you know, like personally stressed and angsted less over the fact that it wasn't happening. If I had channeled more energy into sort of this positive outlook of like, look, I know you can do this. You're very smart. You're very competent. Everyone around you knows that you can get this done and be successful. Yeah. And so if I had done less stressing over over him getting it done um that would have been a lot better for me and uh, like in my health and that's yeah. the other thing that, <laughs> I think that we that we don't think about is like when we when we pass these things off to other people it's not just about the you know like the consequences it, it's not just about us not learning consequences and us not setting boundaries it's also like about the adverse health effects that that has on other people. Those other people are busy too. They have their own lives. They have their own health to worry about. And when, when you are passing things that are stressing you out onto other people, it makes sense that that's going to add to their stress levels. Yes, it does because they care and yet they, they're often powerless. <laughs> exactly. Like there's nothing that they can do to yeah. make you do the thing. Like, yeah, that's what's got to be on you. I think that it just, that I see that a lot with worry, right? That when we're worried about something, it, it's trying to control the world with our mind, right? Yes. It, it's, it, and it's, it's essentially wasted energy because either, you know, it's, it's that whole, you either have it in, the, in your capacity to make a change or you don't. And if you don't, then you have to stop thinking about it. <laughs> and, and that at the same time, if it's somebody else who's coming with, with a, when I'm holding a space for someone who's going through something hard and they're, and they're worried, I think it, what you can do has nothing to do with the problem that they're worried about. What, like, what, what you have to give in that moment is your empathy and your presence for your friend mm-hmm. who's going through the hard thing. So it's not about taking on their problems as your own so much as it is recognizing that, that, that you're there as the support for the supporter, you know, and that what you have to give yes. them is just, is, is holding that space because then, then you're, you, it's a very clear boundary of like, this is, this is my role right now. And actually in reverse, like I, that in my communication, in my communication with my husband, I'm trying to be clear when I need to vent versus when I want him to problem solve because he's very clearly wants to go to solution mode. That's just like, that's how he's built. And sometimes I need that and sometimes I don't. And so it's much more helpful for him <laughs> if I tell him, him, like, hey, I just need to get this off my chest, or like, versus, or even a parenting scr- struggle. Like, there's some things that I need to talk to him about because we need to cope to problem solve together on, and other things that I just need to give him information of, like, hey, this happened, and I'm not really charged about it. I'm just reporting so that we all are on the same page. Versus times when I'm like, hey, we don't need to problem solve. I'm not actually needing to update you, but I just really need to to just vent for a minute. Can you just be in a space of listening? And so for me to give him, like, basically, there are three choices of what I need. In this conversation right now, I need a <laughs> like mm-hmm. that. Uh, that it actually it, it's going. You know, in terms of our being able to to get our needs met uh, with each other is um, is is has been a super helpful little change that I've made. Yeah, that's actually something that I've <laughs> that I, I have been uh, a tool that I've been using with Ben as well. Uh, ben is my husband, and yeah, telling when I need when I need someone just to listen to me, and I don't need them. You know, I don't need them to give me three ways that I could solve the problem. I just need to talk it out for a second. I just need to talk out loud. Mm-hmm. That's it's really important to tell people that, especially if. You're looking to vent and people, because uh, this goes back to like pe- the people that you love want to help you. They care about you. They want to make their, they want to make your lives better or your life better. And so when you come to them with a, when you come to them with a problem, they want to help you solve it. But that's not always what we want when we go to somebody that we love with a problem. Like you said, like sometimes we just need to talk it out. Sometimes we just need to vent and that's okay too. But I definitely like Ben and I have had misunderstandings where 
where, yeah, like I, I, I just want to vent, but he's like, I can solve this problem for you. And I'm like, I, I don't want to solve the, I, I don't want to solve it's the problem. I don't believe useful right now. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, like I know what I could do, but I'm frustrated that I have to do it. Exactly. Yeah. And really it's, it's doing someone a service to tell them what you need in the moment so that they can, so that they can actually give you what you need as opposed to what they think you need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Megan, this has been a super fun chat. Do you have anything else to add for people who might be struggling with the difference between um, between supporting and enabling? Gosh, just to be mindful and self evaluate. I think that's like the the number one, you know, which is which is the root of so many things for so 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 many problems. But um, when you are making a request of someone else, be mindful of why you're asking them to do that. Awesome. Megan, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me today. And if people want to get a hold of you, either just to, to reach out or maybe they have a job lead for you, um, what's the best way that they can do that? Probably to email me. Um, my email address is meganachambers at gmail.com. Megan is spelled M-E-G-A-N. We don't add any of these extra unnecessary letters in. I've had, uh, and I only say that because I've had people spell my name. So oh, yes. And we'll um, make sure that that gets into the show notes. <laughs> anyway, perfect. Megan, thanks so much. This has been a blast. Uh, it's always, always fun to chat. Brody, thanks so much. Thanks for listening today. For more episodes of A Healthy Curiosity, you can visit the iTunes store. If you appreciated today's show, please leave us a review. This helps other people to find the podcast. You can also head to brodywelch.com where you can find free self-care resources, learn more about Chinese medicine, and let me know what you'd like to hear about on future episodes. I'd love to hear from you. Till next time, be good to yourself.